I will be reading aloud to you the book Chasing Vermeer. This is chapters 1 through 3. Chasing Vermeer is written by Blue Balliette. This is the map key. It shows all the buildings near and around Petra and Calder's house. Introduction about pentominoes and about this story. A set of pentominoes is a mathematical tool consisting of 12 pieces. Each piece is made up of five squares that share at least one side. Pentominoes are used by mathematicians around the world to explore the ideas about geometry and numbers. The set looks like this. Pentominoes are named after letters in the alphabet, although they don't look all they don't all look exactly like their names. With a little practice, they can be used as puzzle pieces and put together into thousands of different rectangles of many sizes and shapes. This book begins like a set of pentominoes with separate pieces. Eventually, they will all come together. Don't be fooled by ideas that seem, at first, to fit easily. Don't be fooled by ideas that don't seem to fit at all. Pentominoes, like people, can surprise you about the artwork, a challenge to the reader. If you look carefully at Brett Hulquist's chapter illustrations, you will find a hidden message. It is related to the pentomino code in the book, but not presented in exactly the same form. A certain living creature plays a part in deciphering this code, and pieces of the message appear in the artwork at regular intervals that create a pattern within the book. Here's a hint. This pattern is even but odd. It has many pieces as a set of it has as many pieces as a set of pentominoes. To check your answers, go to www.scholastic.com backslash chasing Vermeer. Chapter one Three Deliveries On a warm October night in Chicago, three deliveries were made in the same neighborhood. A plump tangerine moon had just risen over Lake Michigan. The doorbell had been rung at each place, and an envelope left propped outside. Each front door was opened on to an empty, empty street. Each of the three people who lived in those homes lived alone, and each had a hard time falling asleep that night. The same letter went out to all three. Dear friend, I would like your help in identifying a crime that is now centuries old. This crime was wrong has wronged one of the world's greatest painters. As those in positions of authority are not brave enough to correct this error, I have taken it upon myself to reveal the truth. I have chosen you because of your discriminating eye, your intelligence, and your ability to think outside of convention. If you wish to help me, you will be amply awarded for any risks you take. You may not show this letter to anyone. Two other people in the world have received this document tonight. Although you may never meet, the three of you will work together in ways none of us can predict. If you show this to the authorities, you will most certainly be placing your life in danger. You will know how to, how to respond. I congratulate you on your pursuit of justice. The letter was not signed, and it had no return address. The man had sat down to a late dinner. He liked to read when he ate, and he was on page four of a new novel. Book in hand, he answered the door. His spaghetti and meatballs were cold by the time he remembered them. He sat at the table for a long time, looking first at the letter, then out to, at the moon. Was this a joke? Who would go to the trouble of writing and sending such a letter? It was printed on expensive stationery, the kind you buy if you want to be impressive or pretentious. Should he feel flattered? Suspicious? What did this person want from him? What kind of reward were they talking about? And who was it who knew him well enough to know he'd say yes? A woman tossed and turned in her bed, her long hair trapping moonlight against the pillow. She was going over lists of names in her mind. The more she thought, the more agitated she became. She was not amused. Could this be a coincidence? Or was it a clever warning? What exactly did this person know about her past? She finally got up. A cup of hot milk would calm her nerves. She moved carefully in the dark, using the watery rectangles of light that fell across the floor. 
She wasn't about to turn on the kitchen light. The name scrolled in tidy columns through her mind, each group belonging to a different chapter in her life. There was Milan. There was New York. There was Istanbul. But this was an invitation, not a threat. If things got strange or frightening, she could always change her mind. Or could she? Another woman lay awake under the moon, listening to the wind and the occasional whine of a police siren. This was one of the weirdest coincidences ever. Was this letter insane or inspired? And was she just being gullible, thinking this person was really writing to her? Maybe hundreds of these letters had gone out. Had her name been picked out of a phone book? Fake or not, the letter was intriguing, a centuries-old crime. What could this person be planning? And what was this, What about the spooky part? If you show this to the authorities, you will most certainly be placing your life in danger. Maybe this was a maniac, one of those serial killers. She pictured the police going through her apartment and finding the letter, standing over her body and saying, Gee, she should have called us the first thing. She could have been alive today. A lone cat yowled in the alley below her bedroom and she jumped, her heart pounding. Sitting up in bed, she shut the window and locked it. How could she not say yes? This was, was a letter that could alter history. Chapter 2. The letter is dead. The letter is dead. It was a strange thing for a teacher to say. By the sixth week of sixth grade, Miss Hussey was, still wasn't a disappointment. She had announced on the first day of school that she had no idea what they were going to work on that year or how. It all depends on what we get interested or what gets interested in us, she had added, as if that was obvious. Calder Pillay was all ears. He had never heard a teacher admit that she didn't know what she was doing. Even better, she was excited about it. Miss Hussey's classroom was in the middle school building at the university school in the neighborhood known as Hyde Park. The school sat on the edge of the University of Chicago campus. John Dewey, an unusual professor, had started it a century earlier as an experiment. Dewey believed in doing, in working on relevant projects in order to learn how to think. Calder had always liked the man's appropriate name. Not all teachers at the U, as it was called, still agreed with Dewey's ideas, but Miss Hussey obviously did. They began the year by arguing about whether writing was the most accurate way to communicate. Petra Andely, who loved to write, said it was. Kids like Calder, who hated it, said it wasn't. What about numbers? What about pictures? What about plain old talking? Miss Hussey told them to investigate. They took piles of books out of the library. They found out about cave art in France, about papyrus scrolls in Egypt, about Mayan petroglyphs in Mexico, and about stone tablets from the Middle East. They tried things. They made stamps out of raw potatoes and covered the walls with symbols. They invented a sign language for hands and feet. They communicated for one whole day using nothing but drawings. Now it was almost mid-October. Would they ever study regular subjects like other classes did? Calder didn't care. What they were doing was real exploration, real thinking, not just finding out about what a bunch of dead famous grown-ups believed. Miss Hussey was cool. D-E-A-D, -E she had written it on the board. They were talking about letters that morning because Calder had groaned about having to write a thank you note and said that it was always a, a waste of time. No one cared what you put in a letter. Then, Miss Hussey asked if anyone in the class had ever received a truly extraordinary letter. No one had. Miss Hussey looked very interested. They had ended up with a strange assignment. Let's see what we can find, Miss Hussey began. Ask an adult to tell you about a letter they will never forget. I'm talking about a piece of mail that changed their life. How old were they when they got it? Were they, where were they when they opened it? Do they still have it? Petra, like Calder, was fascinated by their new teacher. She loved Miss Hussey's questions and her long ponytail and the three rings in each ear. One earring had a small pearl dangling from a moon, another a high-heeled shoe the size of a grain of rice, another tiny key. Petra loved how Miss Hussey listened carefully to the kids' ideas and didn't care about right and wrong answers. She was honest and unpredictable. She was close to perfect. 
Miss Hussey suddenly clapped her hands, making Petra jump and setting the little pearl earring into orbit. I know. Once you find a letter that changed a life, sit down and write me a letter. Write me a letter I won't be able to forget. Petra's mind was already racing. Calder put a, pulled a pen, pentomino piece out of his pocket. It was an L. He grinned. L for letter. This letter was definitely not dead. L was one of the simplest pentomino shapes you, to use. Most letters, the kind you mailed, were rectangles, he realized, just like an accurately put together pentomino solution. L was also the twelfth letter in the alphabet and one of the twelfth pentominoes. Today was the twelfth day of October. Calder's grandmother had once told him that he breathed patterns the way other people breathed air. Calder sighed. If only thoughts didn't have to be broken down into words. Too much talk was hard to listen to, and writing, for him, was a brutal process. So much got left behind. Miss Hussey ended the class by saying, Got it? First find, then do. Who knows where this will take us? Calder and Petra lived on Harper Avenue, a narrow street next to the train line. Their houses were three blocks away from the U School and three houses away from each other. They often passed on the street, but they had never been friends. Families came from all over to study or teach at the University of Chicago, and many of them lived in this part of Hyde Park. Since most parents worked, young kids traveled on their own around the campus and to and from school. On the afternoon of October 12, Petra took, walked home from school with Calder half a block ahead of her. She watched him fish around for his key and open his front door. She knew his pockets were full of puzzle pieces. He sometimes muttered things and always looked like he had just woken up. He was kind of weird. Scuffing through the first fall leaves, Petra drifted into the, into the game she often played with herself. Ask a question that doesn't have an answer. Why was yellow cheerful, she wondered, and why was it always a surprise, even when it came in an ordinary shape, like a lemon or an egg yolk? Picking up a yellow leaf, she held it in front of her face. Maybe she would write to Miss Hussey about this. She'd ask if, her if she agreed that humans needed questions more than answers. Calder, at the moment, looked out his front window to see Petra walking by, holding a leaf several inches from her nose. He knew he was kind of weird, but she was exceptionally weird. She was always by herself at school, and she didn't seem to care. She was quiet when the other kids were loud. Plus, she had a fierce triangle of hair that made her look like one of those Egyptian queens. Calder wondered if he was becoming just as much of an oddball. No one had asked him what he was doing after class that day. No one had told him to wait. He'd taken his buddy Tommy's presence for granted. Granted, Not now. Tommy Segovia had lived across the street from Calder until this past August. They had been great friends since second grade when Tommy poured his chocolate milk on Calder's bare legs and asked him how it felt. A teacher rushed over and Calder had explained that it was an experiment and that it felt just perfect. That that was the first of many collaborations. He and Tommy had decided back in July that they weren't going to be mediocre kids. They swore that they were going to do something important with their lives, solve a great mystery, or rescue somebody or be so smart in school that they'd skip grades. That was the same day Calder had received his first set, set of pentominoes. A cousin in London had sent them as a 12th birthday present, even though Calder's birthday wasn't until the end of the year. The pentominoes were yellow plastic and clacked against the kitchen table in a satisfying, dis decisive way. Determined, Calder moved the shapes into one combination after another, flipping and turning them. The biggest rectangle he had put together so far was six pieces. A breeze was coming in the back door, and some morning doves that had nested on the back porch were cooing, making that slippery burbling sound that Calder always associated with summer in his neighborhood. Every detail of that morning with Tommy was strangely clear. At once, Calder had known what to do. The Y had to slide into the U, which had to fit next to the P. He even remembered the sequence of letters. Yup. Y-U-P. He had gotten his first 12-piecer and gotten it fast. When he looked up afterward, he saw the pentomino shapes echoed in the kitchen. The hinges on the cabinets were L's. The water faucets were X's. 
the burners on the stove stood up stood up on neat n legs maybe the entire wor world could be communicated in some kind of pentomino code kind of like a morse code he knew at that moment that he could be a great problem solver or so he told tommy who punched him in the arm and told him he had a swelled head yup he said with a grin calder's head didn't feel too swelled these days he looked at the clock he was already late when Tommy moved away, Calder had taken over his job at Powell's used books. Calder helped out one afternoon a week now, delivering books in the neighborhood or unloading boxes. With Tommy gone, it was something to do. Calder gulped a glass of chocolate milk, stuffed a cookie in each cheek, and set off at a run. Powell's was one of Petra's favorite places. It was peaceful and you never knew what you might find. It looked more like a warehouse than a store. Books were piled everywhere, and the rooms were jumbled together in a mismatched way. Although Petra had been inside many times, it always felt like a labyrinth. One dimly lit area led to the next, and suddenly you were back where you started without knowing how you got there. No one asked if you needed help, but no one frowned, frowned if you read but didn't buy. Petra's mom had sent her to get milk and bread at the grocery store around the corner. Powell's was on the way. Petra had just settled herself on a footstool with a copy of Kidnapped when she saw a long ponytail whip by. Miss Hussey? Petra stood up carefully. She peeked around the corner, ready to pretend to look surprised. There was no one in sight. Petra looked across rows of cookbooks. She tipped carefully through the next room, past English, history, psychology, and pets. She only wanted to see what Miss Hussey was reading. Darn, the next person she saw was Calder. He was bending over a box of books, a piece of paper in his hand. Don't turn around, don't you dare turn around, Petra thought. She didn't want anyone from the class to see her spying. She tipped out around the next corner. Miss Hussey was crouched by the art books. Petra couldn't see what she was looking at, but she noticed several paperbacks next to her on the floor. Agatha Christie, Raymond Chandler. Miss Hussey moved suddenly and Petra jumped backward. To her surprise, Calder was right behind her. He had obviously seen what she was doing. Petra cupped her hand quickly as if to cover his mouth, but she stopped before but stopped before she touched him. They looked equally shocked. Calder, recovering first, peered around the corner. He ducked back in a flash. She's coming. It felt too late to do anything but hide, so they hurried out of history and into fiction. Miss Hussey was at the front desk now. She plopped down her books and began talking to Mr. Watch the man with red suspenders who was usually at the cash register. They were laughing. Did they know each other? Can you see what she has? Petra whispered. Calder walked behind the, their teacher, his eyes on the counter. Miss Hussey never turned her, her head. Murder in a big art book, never something, he, he muttered to Petra when he returned. Miss Hussey left the store with her purchases. A moment later, Petra ducked outside empty-handed, her cheeks burning. She was furious with herself. Powell's had always been her private hideaway, her refuge. Now she'd spoken to Calder there. She'd practically attacked him, and he'd seen her spying on Miss Hussey. What had she started? Chapter 3. Lost in the Art Twenty minutes later, Petra opened her notebook on the desk in her bedroom. Letters. Think about letters. The 538 southbound train went by Petra's window exactly three seconds before it passed Calder's. In between, it shot by the, the Castiglione's, then the Bixby's. Petra had once calculated that it passed a house per second on Harper Avenue. She liked trains. Looking out, she saw the bright shout of a red hat, a child in a purple jacket pressed against the window, a bald head just rising over a stiff rectangle of the newspaper. She'd noticed that colors sometimes left their shapes when things flashed by so fast. She wrote, October 12, yellow leaf, surprise, loud hat, square coat, bald head, like moon, red, lavender, salmon. Question, what does Miss Hussey really want us to see? Petra, can you get me some toilet paper? Coming, Petra sighed heavily as, and got up to help her younger sister. Petra's household was a tornado where life swirled in noisy circles. Sneakers, books, and backpacks traveled through the rooms on unseen currents, and there was always food underfoot and an old frying pan or two on the steps outside the back door. The cats and dog drank from the toilets, having despaired of getting their water bowls filled 
every morning, and everyone in the family talked to one another at the top of their lungs. Petra wished that, that things were different. She wished that her parents would sit quietly at dinner and ask her how her day was, and that her four younger brothers and sisters would carry tissues with them instead of wiping off rivers of goo on their shirt sleeves in public. She wished she wasn't shy, and that she wasn't shaped like a lima bean, and that her left ear didn't stick out farther than her right. She wished she was a famous writer already and didn't have to go through the unfamous stage. She wished her mother wouldn't ever put Baba Ganoush in her lunchbox. When Denise Dodge had towered over her at lunchtime saying, Ew, what's that? Petra had wanted to murder her on the spot, but only came out with a pathetic, Don't you wish you knew? As Denise moved away, Petra heard her saying loudly to her friend, Blech, aren't you glad you don't have to eat Baba Goosh for lunch? The family socks basket was another thing Petra didn't like. She always ended up with one sock either too big or too small. Since no one wanted to sort out all the clean socks that went on to 14 feet every morning, the socks went straight from the dryer into a gigantic hand-woven basket, and it was every person for themselves. Each fall, Petra's mom bought the same color socks for all seven of them so that, in theory, there was always a size that fit them. But reality in the Andalee family was never that tidy. Like many kids in Hyde Park, Petra was a club sandwich of cultures. Her father, Frank Andely, had relatives from North Africa and Northern Europe, and her mother, Norma Andely, was from the Middle East. Petra didn't think much about what racial category she belonged. Her family had let go of that way of looking at things a long time ago. She did know that for many generations on her mother's side, every first child who was a girl had been named Petra. She also knew that Petra was the name of an ancient stone city in Jordan, a sophisticated and graceful city that had risen out of the desert more than 2,000 years ago. Three quarters of its ruins were still covered with shifting sand. She liked the thought that she was named after a mysterious place of buried secrets. The last first daughter had been her grandmother, who lived in Istanbul now. When she had visited Chicago a couple years ago, she had told Petra that all of her namesakes had grown up to be very beautiful and very lucky. The younger Petra had looked doubtfully at her grandmother, who looked whiskery and wispy, and who seemed to spend all day losing everything she needed, like her slippers or her black eyeliner or even the bathroom. Glamour might have been easier in the past. Petra was sure that every Petra before her hadn't had to put up with thick glasses and blue and purple speckled frames and every Petra before her probably hadn't had to worry what she was going to step on first thing in the morning. Dried cranberry juice or a plastic dragon or something coughed up by the dog. On her way to get toilet paper, Petra stepped heavily on a headless soldier, served her right for being so nosy about Miss Hussey. Then Petra heard her parents arguing downstairs. But everyone has something to hide, her dad was saying angrily. He was a physicist at the university, and Petra knew he'd been worried about his job. She heard her mom saying something in an impatient tone, and then the words letter and forgotten, and the quick, harsh sounds of tearing paper. What could this be about? Her parents hardly ever disagreed. A forgotten letter? She wouldn't bring a family secret to school, but she had to look. When she crept downstairs later, however, the garbage was empty. Calder was in a bad mood. The letter assignment felt too hard. How could he ever write Miss Hussey an unforgettable letter? And where was he going to find a stupendous letter now that Grandma Ranjana Ron Ron was gone? Good letters were no longer written. He was sure of it. Calder's dad, Walter Pillay, was slicing eggplant in the kitchen. As he stacked the pale slices neatly into the frying pan, he looked over at his son. Calder was sketching a fierce column of five-piece pentomino squares down the margin of his notebook. Anything wrong? asked his dad. Calder opened his mouth when the 538 train went by, rattling the windows, making the floorboards bounce, and filling the kitchen with the whoosh-whoosh of passing steel. As Calder mouthed, nope, his dad grinned at him and mouthed back, good. Calder, like Katra, was a hybrid kid. His dad was from India, and he had a calm way of speaking that made everyone, everything sound important. His job had to do with planning gardens for cities. Every year, he brought home a new batch of plants to try out in the yard. By August, the front walk had vanished between a tangle of green. This year, a trumpet vine leaned eagerly against a cool lily. Pointy leaves fought to see who could take over the steps. Purples and blood reds argued loudly with each other. It was a good yard for hiding things. 
Calder's mom, Yvette Pillay, had short hair the color of an apricot and a jingly laugh that had made other people laugh even when they didn't know why. She was Canadian and taught math at the university. Calder had never seen either one of them look amazed when they opened the mail. He suddenly tired of the whole idea. He didn't think he wanted to hear about letters. If he asked his mom and dad, they'd probably tell him too much. That was the problem with being an only child. Your parents were always paying attention to you. He envied the kids whose families forgot about them once in a while. Walking down the block the next morning, Calder stirred the pentominoes in his pocket. He pulled out the pea. Funny, Petra was walking ahead of him. He was beginning to think he had been kind of lame yesterday, following her and then ru ruining her adventure. He ducked into a driveway and crept through the, a number of backyards. Under a lilac bush, around an old boat, then over two fences. The only way out was a raspberry patch. He dove in, yelped with pain, and burst out onto the sidewalk just ahead of Petra. Sheesh, you scared me. Sorry, he said, pretending to be surprised. You scared me, too. Petra did not look pleased. What were you doing? Oh, Tommy and I used to go to this school go to school this way. Feeling a stinging on his cheek, Calder wiped off some blood. Right. This conversation wasn't going the way he'd planned. They walked in silence for several minutes. Heard anything from Tommy? Petra asked finally, though she'd hardly said a word to Tommy Segovia in her life. Not much. Calder groped madly for something to say, but everything he thought of sounded stupid. He was going to tell Petra that all the kids in Tommy's new neighborhood had crew cuts, but that was pretty nothing. His pentominoes were making a loud clacking sound. Hey, what do you think about Miss Hussey? She's let us do cool stuff so far, don't you think? I mean, cool for school. Petra, embarrassed by her accidental rhyme, looked sideways at Calder to see if he had noticed. A raspberry twig was standing upright over one of his ears. He looked like a lopsided bee. She was saying dumb stuff, but she hoped Calder would get the message. What happened yesterday in Powell didn't need to be mentioned. Calder was wondering if Petra had any interest in pentominoes or puzzles. She, did she know what was in his pocket? Forget it. He sounded like he was showing off if he asked her. He noticed that she had a couple of Rice Krispies stuck in her hair, but decided not to say anything about that either. By the time they got to school, both were worn out by trying to think of something to say and trying not to say what they were really thinking. The cold cereal and the twig were still in place as they headed in opposite directions to their lockers. Miss Hussey had looked strangely pleased when the assignment failed. After two days of hunting, no one in the class had come up with anything worth sharing. There were several letters about distant relatives dying, school and job acceptance letters, invitations to weddings. Miss Hussey suggested that they go back a few hundred years. Like find old books of letters and stuff, Petra asked, thinking of Powell's. There was a wave of grumbling. How about paintings? All you have to do is look. Miss Hussey said she'd noticed that art often showed what was important to people in any given time. It revealed things. Besides, she'd said with a smile, she was tired of being in school all day. It was time for a field trip. Everyone sat up. Something else, she went on. Getting an unforgettable letter happens once or twice in a lifetime. Writing an unforgettable letter is a pretty tough thing to do unless you have something very real to say. It shouldn't be artificial. Perhaps I made a mistake. She always said the same thing after she had an idea, and always with the undercurrent of, we're in this together and it might be dangerous. Do you agree? Should we bag the assignment for now? There were whistles and cheers. Calder caught Petra's eye and she shrugged and almost smiled. Everyone looked relieved. This year was beginning to feel like something was very right or very wrong. It was hard to tell which. On the following Monday, they took their train to the Art Institute and walked several blocks in the October sunshine. It was difficult to keep up with Miss Hussey's bouncy stride. Calder noticed with approval that she had never even looked back to see if everyone was with her. She was one trusting teacher. After they ate bag lunches next to the bronze lions on the steps of the museum, they fanned out in the, in the European wing. Petra took off on her own. She passed the Degas dancers, the big painting made completely of dots, the Monet haystacks and bridges, and headed to the, into the older works. When she was in third grade, She'd had a babysitter who took her to the Art Institute once a month. The babysitter would sit in front of a painting, sigh a great deal, and sometimes write things down. She'd tell Petra to stay in one area, but not to bother her. Petra would walk around looking. Soon, she began to wonder which paintings would be fun to get in, go into, 
or which one she might like to take home to her room. She thought about which of the children in the painting she'd like to play with. Her babysitter gave her a pad and pencil, and Petra made lists. She once counted all the paintings with red clothing in them. Another time, she secretly counted all the bare bottoms. She also counted all the hats and found 123. Now, she walked around, walked slowly from room to room, hugging her clipboard. She was sure there was a letter somewhere near an angel, or was it rolled up in someone's hand? They had one hour to look, and she knew she'd find something. When Calder saw Petra disappear, he decided to follow her. He stayed a gallery length behind and was so busy trying not to be seen that he barely noticed what was on the walls. Then, quite suddenly, Petra was gone. Calder walked slowly through the next two galleries. It was getting late. He'd better start hunting on his own. Turning a corner, he spotted something promising. It lay on a bedside table in a French painting by an artist named Auguste Bernard. The date was 1780. Calder looked around. He was alone. He leaned against the wall opposite the painting and began to bit in a businesslike way to take notes. The letter was folded up, but had red wax seal that had been broken. He knew this meant it had been opened. The woman next to the letter was rolling her eyes, and her dress was ridiculously small for the top part of her body. Calder concentrated on the table, which also had a necklace of beads and a book with French words on it. He was copying the words down, Léard Diame, when the wall behind him moved. What the? Calder staggered backward into the, a dark doorway and stumbled over someone's feet. The person gave him a sharp push. Then the two of them shot back into the brightness of the gallery. A guard strode over and grabbed Calder by the elbow. Restricted. Can't you read? Too stunned to answer, Calder twisted around to see who had shoved him. What were you doing in there, Petra hissed. What about you? He snapped back. The guard, a pink and gray sausage of a man, crossed his arm. Storage room. No public allowed. Where's your school group anyways? Calder and Petra walked in silence on either side of the sausage to where Miss Hussey was talking with a group of their classmates. There's where she turns into a regular teacher, Calder whispered behind the guard's back. Petra glanced his way with a twinkle and a quick flash of, We'll see, won't we? You in charge? Found these two in a storage room. Miss Hussey looked surprised but not shocked. The kids standing around her t tittered. Petra and Calder looked grim. Thank you, Miss Hussey said to the sausage, making it clear the conversation was over. When the guard was out of earshot, Miss Hussey smiled warmly at Calder and Petra, looking first at one, then the other. Good thinking. Find anything? When Denise changed seats on the train, a scrap of paper floated into Petra's lap. Calder and Petra lost in the art. First a kiss and then a fart. Petra brushed it on the floor, hoping Calder hadn't seen it. Why did kids have to be so stupid sometimes? By the time everyone got off the, at 57th Street, it was too late to go back to school. Miss Hussey waved goodbye, and Calder and Petra started awkwardly down Harper Avenue. See you, Petra muttered over her shoulder as she hurried ahead and zoomed up her porch steps. Petra? What? Petra turned around. What were you doing in there? Just looking. Most museums have too much stuff to have all of it hanging. So if it's not hanging, it's got to be stuck in a closet. Yeah. I guess Miss Hussey would have thought that was cool finding a letter that was off limits, Calder said. That's not very nice. You don't like her? Calder began stirring his pentominoes around in his pocket. I do. Petra looked at him, looked curiously at him. You're jealous of me. I am not. Admit it, Petra grinned. Well, just about your storeroom idea. Petra's face closed. Of course. Then she was gone. What had just happened? Calder pulled out one of his pentominoes and tossed it in the air. I for idea, he said aloud. Or was I for idiot?